Welcome to Purpose 360. I'm Carol Cohn, and today more than ever before, companies, brands, and their partners need to stand for something beyond the bottom line. I've created this program to provide insights and ideas to share with you so that you can apply them to your work the very next day. The goal here is to up-level your purpose and to benefit companies and society. So please join us. a smile from ear to ear today because I have a gentleman with me, Mark Retzloff, who is not just a pioneer in the natural foods and organic industries. He is like the godfather. And I think that, um, you know, in his bio, he, he's the co-founder of Horizon Organic Dairy. And I've already had cheese and milk from Horizon Organic Dairy. It's in my refrigerator. Aurora Organic Dairy, Alpha's, Alfalfa's Markets, and Flock LLC. And we're going to talk about most of those later in our show. I just want to read and embarrass Mark just a little bit because he's done so many wonderful things. Mark Retzloff is a pioneer in the natural, organic, and sustainable food and agriculture industry with a 51-year career starting and managing a, a number of highly successful companies. He is co-founder and former chairman and CEO of Alfalfa's Markets, the Boulder-based natural food stores. He also co-founded Aurora Organic Dairy in 2003 and currently acts as a senior advisor to the company. He was University of Michigan's School for the Environment and Sustainability pr practitioner and residence for 2014 and 15, as well as 2016, and serves on the Colorado State University School of Agriculture Dean's Advisory Board. He is past chairman of the Board of Natural Habitats Group in Rotterdam, Netherlands, and Boulder-based, and it's a fully integrated leader in organic, worldwide sustainable palm oil production, processing and distribution. And I know Mark is really, really very proud of that company and his work there. He currently, and I love this list, mentors, counsels, consults, and advises just tens and 20 and 30 and 40 and 50 numerous leaders and companies in the natural organic, local and sustainable food and agriculture sectors. In 2019, he co-founded Flock LLC, and we're going to get into that later, which is a dynamic movement aimed at fast-tracking regenerative agriculture for the preservation of the planet and people. Since its founding, Flock has established a 501c3 and is scheduled to launch an accelerator with the wonderful Techstars group in 2021. Welcome to the show, Mark. Thank you, uh, Carol. This is, uh, I'm glad to be here with you. Well, let me just now embarrass you just a little bit more because there's just so much wisdom in this amazing gentleman. He started his career in the natural foods retail as founder of Eden Foods in Ann Arbor, Rainbow Grocery in Denver, you got around, Mark, and the original Alfalfa's Markets, which merged with Wild Oats in 1996. In 1990, he was chairman of the Organic Food Alliance, which was instrumental in passing the federal 1990 Organic Food Production Act in Washington, D.C., which had a huge impact on the entire industry. I also like to include something in here called by the numbers, because Mark has had an impact on so many organizations. When we talk about Horizon Organic Dairy, he proudly states the fact that the company had 125% compounded annual growth rate for over seven years. He also, and I love this group and list of companies, he has helped emerging companies in the following fields, organic seafood, biodiesel, ice cream, goat cheese, 
traditional medicinals, hemp milk, organic juice, sustainable palm oil, as we mentioned, and footwear with one of our favorite companies, Crocs. He is also co-founder and senior advisor to Naturally Boulder, a 240-plus company, 1,400-member organization. I told you that Mark has a lot of impact on a lot of people. So we could go on and on, but I think it's now time to get into the conversation. So, Mark, you're a pioneer in the organic and natural foods industry. You're a visionary in your mission to not just shape the category, but to transform the conventional food and agriculture industries. So can you tell us briefly about who is Mark Retzloff and what has been your career journey and why do you do what you do? I get asked that question uh, a bit, uh, maybe not in that form, Carol, but I do get asked that. Um, you know, I, uh, hey, I grew up outside uh, Detroit in a suburb of Detroit, you know, in the, uh, in the 50s and 60s. And, um, you know, I had a, 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 a stay-at-home mom, and I was the oldest of four kids, and um uh, I think I was, I got blessed with uh, my mother's passion for reading and for education. When uh, She came from a very, very uh, low-income family, uh, single-parent family in Indiana. But when she was a junior in high school, won the scholarship for a full scholarship to Purdue University. Oh, nice. Uh, but unfortunately, her university, uh, Work got cut short because uh, she had me <laughs> when she was a junior in college. Okay, <laughs> and then uh, uh, and she was, but she was wonderful to uh, to uh, encourage me and uh, throughout my uh, childhood. My father was also uh, an automobile engineer. Obviously, we came from we were living in Detroit, so that made a lot of sense outside Detroit. But you know. When I went to the University of Michigan, I had been in, in, in high school a 4.0 student in honor society and student council and that kind of stuff. But when I went off to college, um, I, it was, you know, it was one of those times when it was the uh, early uh, mid 60s and the Vietnam War was going on. And I really got involved as an uh, uh, anti war activist. I was doing that and, and involved with groups like the Students for Democratic Society and so forth. But as it became uh, a little bit too violent for me, I switched over to being an environmental activist because I had transferred into the School of Natural Resources at, at Michigan. That really fundamentally changed the way I looked at things. At the same time I was doing that, my roommates and I were had gotten introduced to this macrobiotic <laughs> diet. Right. Okay. I, and, yeah, the Inst I was in Boston, the Cushy Institute macrobiotics right. was really big. <laughs> right. And so I actually, after I graduated in 1970, um, I actually went to Boston and worked at, uh, you know, studied there for five months under Cushy and uh, <laughs> okay. worked at Air One and and a couple restaurants, the macrobiotic restaurants I had there, and I, then I moved back to uh, Michigan, uh, and that's when we really began uh, uh, with Eden Foods, and um, so I lived in Ann Arbor, and we were producing this, you know, uh, beginning to develop the store. And at, the, and at that time, I was also finishing up my last semester in school. So um, I couldn't work the, you know, a lot of the hours during the day in the store. So they would give me assignments. And so one of my assignments at that time was to go out and find suppliers of products for us, mostly bulk items, mm -hmm. agricultural products. And I and the, 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 the very significant part of that was that I one day I went out to visit this farmer outside of Ann Arbor, 
His name was Tom Breland. And I was sitting at his kitchen table. And I, my request was if he could produce uh, some um, navy beans and some corn for, for chips and for grinding into cornmeal. And uh, the other thing was white pastry flour, which is was growing in that part of Michigan as one of a, a crop that people were were uh, uh, producing a lot. And I was sitting there and, and talking to him, and uh, and I, uh, he said, "Yeah, we can do that. I mean, uh, I can grow those crops for you." And then I said, "Well, I want you to grow them organically for me." And he said, what do you mean by that? (laughs) And I was sitting there and uh, there was no definition. There was nothing out there at that time. There was no certification organizations. Uh, This was 1969, okay, something like that, 70, something right around that time. And so I said, listen, uh, here's what I, uh, that uh, I know about it. You uh, you can't use any chemical pesticides or fertilizers. You have to use things like compost or or livestock manure and stuff like that. Well, it's just very simple, okay. And he said, "Well, uh, I can do that. That's the way my dad and my grandfather and my great grandfather all farmed here." And I'm going like, "This is great." And uh, he said, but you have to pay me more money. I, I immediately said, because, you know, he'd said, yeah, I can grow that. I said, fine, we'll pay you more for that. And he said, you know, Mark, um, farmers around here, if they feel that they can make more money in producing a crop like this, they're going to be interested in it. And, uh, and that was a big aha for me. When I got in my car and I left, uh, Mr. Vreeland's property and driving back into Ann Arbor. I began thinking about what I had been learning in my environmental classes, that uh, agriculture was the, the single largest point of pollution in the United States. When you counted up all uh, the soil that was being um, uh, running down into the streams, the, the pesticides and the and the chemical fertilizers and so forth that was being put into the air. Uh, and so uh, we were losing, the, the, you know, it was the, the, we were losing topsoil. The water was getting uh, uh, polluted. Uh, the air was getting polluted. There was farm worker uh, health issues. So I began thinking about this. Wow. Uh, this, he said he would change, and so I began thinking, you know, so how do I, how can I connect this? And I began realizing that if I could get consumers interested in these products, I could get more of these farmers, and I could be reducing that kind of environmental damage. So, and then I began making the connection between the food and the farming, and what I could do, and so that's when I really got motivated to 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 get more involved in the retail part of our business. I graduated that that um, that fall. My wife and I had gotten married, and my wife and I had moved out to Seattle, Washington, where uh, I, I worked at an Airwan store, ran an, uh, the Airwan store in Seattle, and then um, had started a spring water business where I would. There was this dairy up in the mountains outside of Seattle, uh, a, a dairy processing company. That used all spring water in in their plant, and I had take I had this big stainless steel truck that I would take the water up out at, from their spring down into Seattle, and I would go along. I'd give people bottles, and I'd fill up their bottles. I'd take the empties, fill it up, and then and, and pick it back on their porch. And it was kind of a strange thing to doing because everybody in Seattle at that time felt that their water was as clean as you could get. It was all coming down from the mountains and so forth. But at that time they were putting fluoride into it and some chlorine into it. And and that's why I had started the spring water business. Uh, this lasted for about a year and then I moved back to Ann Arbor and worked again at Eden for a while. You are so ahead of your time 
regarding, you know, you went to Boston, then you went to the farmer, you asked, could he produce organically? Why? Yeah, I mean, I know you were studying it, but there, you made the connection. You took these disparate points of health for a personal health, air health, soil health, worker health. How did you make those connections? <laughs> I'd like to say that I was smart, <laughs> but, you know, I think it was, uh, be, you know, when, you, when you're trying to bring about change, and, you know, when I was an anti-war activist and then I was an environmental activist. And when you put, you know, so you're trying to bring about change. So a lot of it was communicating with people and, and trying to encourage them to, to uh, have the same beliefs that you have about things. And so I realized in the food industry, it was, it was the same type of thing. I was kind of naive or too young to think about what a great opportunity this was and maybe, you know, blah, blah, blah. It was more about these were my beliefs. These are things that I really felt strongly about. And so uh, I, I, I kind of look back at my mom and, you know, I was the oldest of four kids. And so, you know, she was encouraging me to do things because she didn't want me under her feet because she was taking care of these other kids as well. <laughs> okay. okay? Yeah. So she encouraged me to have a paper route. And I painted houses and I cut yards and I sold Christmas cards and those type of things. I was always active in doing these things. So, you know, for me to be active out there doing this just was all part of the way part I of thought. Just you. Yeah. That's what, you know, my, uh, my parents had encouraged me and, and, you know, to do. And I felt, oh, well, this is just natural. I can do this. So what? So, you know, maybe talking to Erwan or the farmer, what you got some positive reinforcement, but most of your friends, they must have thought it's like when I started linking companies and social issues, they thought I was weird. So what kind of response did you get? Because I know one of your quotes is never give up, never take no for an answer. So how did you keep driving forward? Well, it's part of it is having a vision and a dream. OK. And uh, then walking your talk. With that vision and dream, if you have it, then you, you know, be, I was always carrying it on my, you know, on my collar. Okay. I was out there talking about it. And so, uh, and you know what? I have to say the University of Michigan encouraged that. Mm. Okay. To be, you know, to think creatively and go out and do things. And so, um, and I did that. Yeah, you, you did. So, I got to meet the the, uh, the Springfield Creamery folks and the Keezys, you know, all, all of these. You know, this was just what was going on in the industry at that time. Stan, Stan Amy was running uh, uh, Nature's Northwest at that time. So I would stop into his store. And how did all how did all these people feel? I mean, you were these little islands that had these strong beliefs about what food should be. Um, but they were very much in, in the shadows, albeit good shadows. Well, we were all kind of hippies. I understood what it was. You know, we were all part of the anti-war movement and we were all part of uh, just a more liberal way of looking at things. And the food industry was something that we were sharing and, and doing. So that was really kind of at the, at the beginning of that whole thing that was going on in the Northwest going on in places like Ann Arbor and Boston and, and uh, LA and, and other parts of the country. So, and then uh, when I moved back to, uh, uh, came back from this program down in Houston, putting together that whole um, fooding operation. Mm -hmm. And we had a rainbow grocery in Seattle, San Francisco, Malibu, Kansas City, Chicago, Boston, and so my one part of my job was to oversee that, and that was uh, that was that was a significant because we lasted about a year in Denver, and then decided that we wanted to move up to Boulder, and we found a location up there, and in 1979, we opened up. Pearl Street Market, which uh, we ran that for a few years successfully there as a, as a 
a little bit larger natural food store. Were you, were you still selling in bulk? And I, I remember there used to be sawdust on the floors. And Yeah, we were selling in bulk. Uh, we weren't selling any. It was a lot of produce, a lot of bulk. Uh, we were carrying uh, vitamins and, and herbs and those type of things. There wasn't a lot of packaged foods. There was some, but there wasn't, you know, there wasn't very much at that time. We were doing very well. And we decided to open up another store in Boulder, a larger store. And uh, we, we decided to call that store Alfalfa's, where the whole gang shops. Okay. And we kind of used the, our gang. Love it. <laughs> people like, you yeah. know, like Spanky and Alfalfa and Darla and Buckwheat and all those, you know, because they were all kind of, you know, we wanted people to shop with our, at our gang, with our gang. I mean, that was kind of the way we were playing it. But what ended up happening is that we opened up uh, the Alfalfa's market. It was much larger. I uh, found Mel Coleman. Uh, he came walking in my door one time and said, hey, I'm a rancher from Southern Colorado, and I'm going to uh, produce meat that hasn't been messed with. There's no antibiotics and no, no hormones, and they're only out on pasture. And would you like to buy my beef? And I'm going like, wow. I had visited out to to uh, Mrs. Gooch's out in California with Sandy Gooch, and they were uh, had... Uh, put in a meat department. So I said, wow, with this new store in Alfalfa's, we're going to put a meat department in and we're going to uh, have Mel Coleman bring in the meat for us. And so we did that. And we got Mel started in, in Coleman Natural Beef. And then Mel became, you know, the, the chief activist on, on uh, natural meat and bringing that to market. That's important because I'll talk about that a little bit later on. Sure. So what did you, I'm just, I want to get a little bit from the retail to the horizon. What did you really love about retail and what didn't you like about retail? I loved the interaction with the customers. Uh, even when we started Rainbow Groceries, even back at Eden Foods, the key thing was to have a relationship with the customers and understand what they were buying and why. So, and, and listen to them. I think that was really a key understanding. I've been listening to consumers and trying to get consumer insights my entire career since I was in retail. They'll tell you what they want. And if you can can deliver what they want, they'll come to continue to shop with you. So I would spend, when I would spend time in the stores, I would talk to the customers. I would make suggestions to them. I would be kind of role modeling also for my employees that so that they understood that this is you know this is the kind of connection that we needed to make. We made sure we did a lot of demoing and and, and sampling of products because that's another good way to be able to chat with them and find out what they like and so forth. So that's to me that was key in retail. And and were people using the term organic in those days? Were they asking for, I want food that's more pure, it doesn't have pesticides, I want it to be, you know, animals that are fairly treated? I mean, what were the, what was the feedback you were getting? You know, we were uh, looking for that. We were buying some organic produce and local produce was organic and, uh, uh, and so forth. A lot of the groceries were not available as, as, uh, Organic. I mean, you could buy brown rice and you could buy wheat flour in bulk and stuff and, and beans and stuff. But really, packaged goods was really not uh, very prevalent at that time in organic. But in uh, sometime around in the mid to maybe 87, I'm not sure the exact date on this, Carol, but 60 Minutes ran a program on. Alar, which was a, a chemical that was being sprayed on apple tree. On apples. It was the cover of Time magazine. Right. And so that it could be, they would all ripen at the same time. Additionally, they were spraying that, with the uh, salad bars were becoming very popular. Okay. And so they also found that if they sprayed it on salad bars, that the product wouldn't wilt, okay? 
So, but that's what 60 Minutes and, and Time Magazine picked up on. Well, that was huge when 60 Minutes ran a whole thing on the fact that we were poisoning our children this way. With apples and, you know, salad and bars and stuff like that. So, uh, living in it and having a store in Boulder, uh, where people were very aware of these type of things, we would just have customers all day long coming in and asking, you know, where's all your organic produce? Can I get this organic? And so on and so forth. And that was really probably the, uh, the, the probably the number one stimulus for organic food in, in the United States at that time, that program. It really skyrocketed stuff. Let's take a break and find out what else is happening besides this podcast that you may want to know about. There's good news for the seas, and I'm sure that Mark Retzloff, because he supports the environment so strongly, um, would be happy to hear this. 14 countries responsible for 40% of the world's coastlines have signed a new pledge to end overfishing, restore fish populations, and stop the flow of ocean plastic in the next 10 years. Each of the countries has also committed to making sure all oceans within their national jurisdictions, a combined area roughly the size of Africa, are managed sustainably by 2025. For additional information on this topic, go to The Guardian. There's also additional news about the seas. The most incredible environmental group you've never heard of is called Pristine Seas. Since 2008, they've inspired the creation of 23 marine reserves, two-thirds of the world's fully protected marine areas, covering an area of more than 5 million square kilometers. They're now gearing up for another decade of expeditions and believe they can double what's already been accomplished. For additional information, go to National Geographic. Now, back to our interview with Mark. So let's jump to, you had a major role in creating the Organic Food Production Act so that there were standards, so that there were common definitions. Can you talk a little bit? So here you have this kind of hippie activist guy. Now you're going to Washington and you're advocating. So so tell, you know, you want to, I'm fascinated now. Well, at that time, there was one trade organization called NNFA. National Nutritional Foods Association, and they had regional uh, branches. I was, uh, in my region, it was Rocky Mountain Nutritional Foods Association. So I got on the board of Rocky Mountain Nutritional Foods Association when first when we were at Pearl Street Market. And then by the time I was at Alfalfa's, I had become the president of the Rocky Mountain Nutritional Foods Association. So that was representing the retailers and distributors and that kind of thing. So I had a little bit of gathering what I had to do to be active in the industry through that. And I'd gone to the NNFA trade show, okay, and those type of things. So at that time, there was a lot of natural foods uh, uh, stores that were, uh, you know, at that time we had two and we were getting ready to look at another one uh, down in uh, Santa Fe. Uh, I had become friends with uh, Miss uh, Sandy Gooch and the, uh, Mrs. Gooch's. I had become friends with Anthony Harnett at. Oh, I know Tony. Uh, Tony and Susan. They were in Boston. Red right. Circus was a pro- client of ours. So they were. Uh, we became friends. Uh, John Mackey uh, uh, at Whole Foods, and then uh, Peter Roy had Whole Foods Company in New Orleans. Stan Amy up in uh, uh, Portland. Uh, Terry Dalton from the Unicorn down in um, Miami. So we kind of we kind of got together. I mean, they would come out to Colorado with their families, and we'd all go skiing, 
or we would meet down in New Orleans and and uh, go to the restaurants and just talk and and really became you know and Peter Roy was very instrumental in this and what we call the natural network and we were this we were we weren't competing with each other we were just sharing the best practices and and uh, and sourcing and those type of things together and um uh, so so I was got I, I got really networked into the into the uh, the natural food part of the uh, nutritional foods uh, thing, and uh, during that time, uh, Doug Green came to visit me from New Hope, and uh, he was you know New Hope at that time was still headquartered in New Hope, uh, Pennsylvania, and Doug came in and saw the stuff that was going on. You know, here we had. Uh, Steve Demos was taking tofu around in a wagon and delivering it to stores. You know, we had alfalfas going. We had celestial seasonings going. So he thought, hey, this is much more active than what's going on in Little New Hope. So he that's when he moved New Hope out to Colorado, which uh, made Boulder uh, much more uh, appreciated on the, on the map out there in, in the natural products industry. But so anyway, so that was going on, Carol, at that time. You know, we were having, we were getting together and talking about things and building it. You know, one thing led to another with that. Uh, Anthony Harnett decided to hook up with Mrs. Gooch's. Okay. And uh, before we knew it, uh, everybody was talking to one another about things. Okay. But I was really still drawn to what was going on with organic foods. And, you know, one of the problems I saw was at that point, we probably had 23 or 24 states that had had passed organic legis- legislation, uh, California obviously being the biggest. But the problem was, uh, for example, in Colorado, I had to bring something that was certified organic in California, I also had to get it certified organic in Colorado. Uh, it was causing a lot of uh, problems with consumer uh, confusion. There was a restraint of trade kind of going on because, you know, I always have to check if I was allowed to bring that product into Col- Colorado before I could bring it in So and, and call it organic. So, and all of us in the retail industry began saying, hey, this is a big pain in the you-know-what. Okay, so uh, we get, began talking, and uh, at that time, there was a, a gentleman in the industry named Tom Hardy, and Tom had this company called AgriSystems, and he was consulting with certification organizations and retailers and other on organic standards and organic products and how to to convert and so on and so forth. Tom said, "Hey, we need." To uh, your whole industry, you know, the, the, the retailers and the manufacturers and the distributors and what we call the market side of the business needs to have some representation in what's going on out there. And so we chatted and that's when I start, uh, Tom and I and a few others started and Sandy Gooch and uh, Peter Roy and a couple of others of us started up the Organic Food Alliance which was made up of all the people who were not farmers who were interested in seeing if we can't find a a national law. I became the chairman of that. Well, that stimulated me to to hurry up and and retire as the CEO of Alfalfas at that time. And uh, so I went to Washington, D.C. I went there about every other week for two or three days, met up with the, there was also another group, the, a lot of the state organizations were coming together and there was some farmer organizations starting. So I went there and I was talking with, you know, I was involved with, with the, you know, the different groups that were working on getting this, working with Senator Leahy. We decided we needed a trade organization. So there was a, a number of us that got together. Joe Smiley was one of them. Chris Killam from up in, uh, up in Boston. He was still at, at Bread and Circus at that time. 
And we all got together and we decided to start the Organic Trade Association and we hired Kathleen, Catherine DiMatteo to be our first executive director. And we all put in some money from our organizations and companies to get it going. And I became, as a chairman of the Organic Food Alliance, I became uh, kind of the head lobbyist. And so Man of many talents. Okay. Catherine and myself and a, and a, a lobbyist named Bob Gray started doing the lobby. And my job was to work with all the food trade associations and go to, you know, go to the offices and so forth. Catherine, Kath, uh, Catherine was, the, her, her, her job was to start getting together the Organic Trade Association. So I would go about every other week, I'd go to Washington, you know, with uh, Meet Bob Gray, and we would just go from one office to another, meeting with everybody on the uh, House Ag Committee and the Senate Ag Committee. And what did they say to you in terms of like, you know, you wanted to get the standard, you, you tried to explain to them what organic was about. What kind of response did you get? Well, because uh, because Leahy was uh, very much involved in this because of uh, uh, Ed Barron was his chief legislative aide at that time and Kathleen worked for him. And so she was working with Ed to get this the draft up the law, but they didn't know what to draft. So... What we ended up doing is that we decided as the burgeoning OTA that we would hold listening sessions around the country. Yeah. Okay. And there's your listening skills again. They're coming out. Listen to yeah. consumers and I'll ask, going around the country and asking. Right. So we went to, we held about five of them around the country. There would be anywhere from three to four or 500 people there. And, you know, we would, you know, bring up, we would, make some presentations, but we would mostly listen to, depending on whether they were in the produce industry or the dairy, or nobody was in the dairy industry at that time, but uh, uh, whether they were producers or they were distributors. And we were really trying to sort out, you know, on certain topics or uh, areas of concern in the law, where we had to sit on those things. And what we were really trying to do at that Carol, is to make a really big tent so everybody could fit under it. And that was really difficult because each one of these certification organizations and these state programs that these companies were working on were working under different systems or different standards at that time. So, you know, trying to bring them all together and say, okay, well, you know, you got to compromise a little bit here so we can get, because these guys are doing it this way, you're doing this. Why don't you get together and talk about it and come back and say what you can agree on? And so our first thing was to find out where we agreed. And then where we disagreed was where we had, we ended up putting together groups of people to talk about it and see if they could come back and work out things. And if we eventually got to just a few things that were where we had to, you know, disagree, then we would have to get into more, much more intense. But at that time, they were starting to hold hearings. And that's when we got involved in all this. Okay, so that was going on. And the law finally got passed in uh, the spring or the July. Or anyway, it was in, in the latter part of, of uh, 1990. In the last year uh, that I was running alfalfas, I had I had a lot of customers coming in, and I was here again. And I was listening to them, and they were telling me, "How come you have organic produce and you have organic grains and beans and other products, but you don't have any organic dairy products?" I, you know, I serve those to my family every day, and there's no organic dairy. What? Okay, briefly, what does organic milk farming dairy look like when you were mentioning the Tim? What was your vision? Well, I would like to be able to get milk. The first product I wanted to be able to get was milk. Mm -hmm. Okay. And he was a dairy farmer and, you know, he had uh, a large dairy farm outside of uh, Boulder. And, uh, you know, he was selling it off to dairy farmers of America, you know, and I said, well, listen, if we could do this, then, you know, we, we could help find somebody. And I, 
the Robinson Dairy, which was in Denver, was supplying me with all my product. And I had talked to Dick Robinson and he said, well, we can bottle it for you if you can get it produced. And okay. and what it, what is in the production? It's I'm assuming it's it's the cows, the feed that they eat, the grass that they eat. Well, at that time we were defining it as no antibiotics. Okay, to the cow. No hormones. Right. And uh, grown without pesticides. The okay. feed. The feed. The, past, the pasture and the feed. The law got passed in 1990, but right. the regulations didn't get really promulgated till uh, 99, 2000. Mm. So Mark Pepperzak said, yeah, I think we can do it. So him and I did a feasibility study on uh, whether we could take it to market and so on and so forth. And it came back that we did. Uh, then, but I had gone off to Washington. And so, um, and, but I kept that in mind. And I told Paul Rapetto that I was looking at that. He called me from a sustainable foods conference that he was at in uh, Wisconsin at the Michael Fields Institute and said, hey, I just ran into a guy that's got three organic dairy farmers. So I told him, okay, I'm getting on the next plane out there, which I did. Went out there and I met the guy and his name was George Seaman. And George had started, that was one of the founders of an organization called the Cooley Region Organic Produce Pool, which had another name they called Organic Valley. Uh -huh. Okay. So I said to George, what are you doing with the milk you're producing? Your farmers are producing. He said, well, we're separating the cream and uh, we're selling that to a company that's making ghee, clarified butter. And we're taking the skim milk and we're just selling it into the conventional market. And so I said, well, listen, I'll buy all the skim milk from you. And uh, he agreed that, okay, well, we can do that. And uh, I said, Let me, I'll, I'm, I, I, and, you know, I went, we went back to Boulder, Paul and I, we got there and said, what are we going to do with just skim milk? Okay. And, you know, being a good retailer and watching what was going on with yogurt, I said, well, you know, Paul, we could do non-fat yogurt. Hey, organic non-fat yogurt, there's no yogurt out in the marketplace and we can start there because we can't, you know, we, we can't just sell skim milk, okay? Because, you know, whole milk was what was sold mostly and then some reduced fat. So we started Horizon Organic Dairy as a yogurt company. So we would get the, the skim milk from Organic Valley. We'd have it delivered to a plant in Madison, Wisconsin on Sundays. I would go out there on Sundays and uh, we started off with six flavors, um, raspberry, strawberry, coffee, and vanilla, and plain, and blueberry. Okay. But we decided, Paul and I being, you know, from the manufacturing side and me being from retail, uh, when we started doing our numbers, we realized that, hey, this is, that, you know, eight ounce cups of organic yogurt. We got to get organic fruit, organic sugar, and we got to get organic milk. You know, we're going to be selling, you know, normally it's 59 cents a cup. We're going to be selling it for 80 or 99 cents a cup. That's not going to work. So we decided to reduce it to six ounce cups. By far, the largest consumers of, of cup yogurt were women. And children, and most of them didn't finish the whole eight ounce cup. And so we said, mm, this may work. So we introduced the six ounce cup into the US yogurt industry, and we were able to have our product, at, at, you know, anywhere from 10 to 15 cents higher, but we felt it, there wasn't enough difference there to, to discourage people from buying our product. And then we took the 32 ounce plain and vanilla and we, we lowered that to 24 ounces. Okay. It still looked like a big thing, but it's also we got it down to get the price point. Yeah. So that was the beginning of Horizon Organic Dairy was, it was as a yogurt company. I was able to contact my friends at all the distributors 
that I knew and, and, and the retailers. Well, basically, basically it was the retailers because the retailers I'd call, I'd call up Anthony Harnett or at that time, a guy named P- Tim Sperry was running the uh, purchasing for that. And I'd say, Hey, I got organic yogurt. Really? You got organic yogurt? Fine. We want it. Or Mrs. So, but my very first customer was, uh, Mrs. Gucci's. And, and I knew, I, I met a guy out in California who was a broker to Ralph's Markets in, Cal, in Los Angeles, Hank. And I asked Hank, can you talk to Ken Henshaw, at, at the VP of dairy at Ralph's about organic dairy products? So he talked to Ken and Ken said, yeah, I'm interested, but I'm really interested in organic milk. And, I, you know, I said, then I said to Hank, I don't, I don't have enough milk to do organic milk, but I'm, I'm working on it really, really hard. Went back, talked to Organic Valley, asked them if they could get, start getting more and more farmers, you know, certified. And they said, yeah, we're working on it. We're working on it. And then the USDA approved bovine growth hormone for use in dairy. And there was a huge outcry from the consumers across the country. And in particular, Safeway in California called me right after the law got passed because there was all kinds of protests going on in front of their uh, corporate headquarters and in in front of their stores saying that we're not going to shop in your stores if you start, you put start using a BGH milk. So I was getting calls from every retailer in the country. I went back to um, George Seaman and said, George, you know, I need more farmers. I need more farmers. And he said, well, we got some more coming on and some coming on. And so I said, fine. So we finally got enough where we could ship a full truck of milk to a processor in Des Moines, Iowa. And they would produce our milk in whole milk and low fat and uh, skim. We sent the first truck of milk, I think it was 92, yeah, the fall of 92. We sent it out to California. Ralph's took it in to all their stores and Mrs. Gucci's took it in. That was the start of Horizon Organic Dairy Milk. And from then on, we grew at a compound annual growth rate of 125%, over 125% a year for the next seven years. It was like a rocket ship. And it's, it's amazing. And, but you sold it. So what was that like? You sold it to Dean Foods, right? Well, what happened is that, uh, you know, as you're growing, you need capital to grow. And so we were, we were constantly doing fundraising and financing. We went public in 1998. I think that 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 was wildly successful. We were one of the very first organic and natural food companies that had gone public out there. And so there was a lot of pent up demand for that out there. So we went public. We got put a lot of capital in the the bank. We, We, I proceeded to use that capital. I went out and negotiated to buy two other organic milk companies that had started since then. One was called Juniper Valley, which was owned by Elmhurst Dairy in New York. Uh, and the other one was the Organic Cow of Vermont, uh, partly owned by Hood Dairy. And so I went out and negotiated with both of those companies to buy their brands because I really coveted uh, being in the Northeast, okay, it's and, and plus, particularly in New York, as the media center of the of literally the world, world, it's also the media center for food in the United States. And uh, I wanted to be in the media center because I found earlier on that uh, the best I couldn't afford to do advertising. What I could do though is I could go and have death side conversations with the food editors. And there was a woman in New York who was a food editor at New York Times. You probably know her. But 
I got meetings with her. I got meetings with the Chicago uh, Tribune food editor, the New York Times, uh, the L.A. Times food editor and the San Francisco. And what were the editors saying about organic milk? Well, they were very intrigued by it because they'd heard about, about organic, but organic milk was the category they felt they felt it was a it was a a, a, a great entry point for organic. Okay. And of course, I was talking about the dense nutrient value of milk and so on and so forth, and and that it was uh, it was hitting our demographic, which was women. I then uh, we decided that we wanted to do some work over in Europe, so I went over there and got our office started. We uh, really focused in the UK. I bought three companies over there: a uh, Rachel's Orga- uh, Organic Dairy, which was the leading uh, organic yogurt company in in the UK. And uh, then I bought a couple companies, which were milk companies. And then I went to uh, Japan and did a licensing of Horizon Organic over there as well. And this was after we had gone public. And then about 1991, uh, I got t- I got I decided just that I was you know I'd gotten the company to where it was. Things were feeling good. I was starting to have some other interests out there besides just running a dairy company. And, and it had become a public company. I'd lost control. Okay, we had a board and two-thirds of them were not involved in the food industry. And, and But as a public company, they were stock markets were asking us to change who we had on the board and so on and so forth. And we were being, you know, analysts were following us and uh, the... the it just wasn't. I, I, I just felt that we were losing uh, control of what our real, true mission was with the company and building the organic marketplace. wonderful conversation we're having with Mark. He is a fountain of information of the earliest days of the organic foods movement and the painstaking steps, but the the depth of his commitment to truly build a movement. A lot of people talk about movements, but Mark really contributed to it, putting so much of his heart and soul into truly codifying organics, creating the organic milk industry. And he just continues, he seems unstoppable to advance uh, wonderful new food companies. And in part two, we're going to take a pause, but in part two, he's going to give us a lot of his best insights for emerging food companies, emerging entrepreneurs, how to truly grow a company, and also how to find partners if you're going to sell and maintain your values. So stay tuned. Come back to part two because there's a lot of terrific insights that Mark will continue to share with us. <music> 